Okay, so welcome to the Tree Fodder Virtual Seminar. It's the session two. We're going to be talking mulberries with Eliza Greenman. Super excited. Um, this, just want to mention this uh, recording and this event and the grant that we on our farm were able to work on um, was all sponsored through Northeast SER through a farmer grant, which is, uh, so, so I have a little disclaimer here just to kind of acknowledge and appreciate the funding that's helped run this and, and all the research we've been able to do. Um, so this material is based upon work supported by NIFA, National Institute for Food and Agriculture. Uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and it's through the Northeast Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program under subaward number FNE19930. And as I mentioned before, uh, at civilpasturebook.org, there is a tree fodder page now, and that'll have um, the grant report, uh, species profiles, at, once that report is, is done. So early 2022, it should be all said and done. Um, the recordings from today and then some other resources as well. I mentioned there's a collective uh, resource research library. I said Zotero and someone reminded me that folks may not know what that means. So Zotero is a, um, a nice platform to help organize uh, various references um, when doing research. And so I've created a group, a tree fodder group. And if folks share any resources during this event, I'll add them to that. And if anyone has a whole bunch of resources that they want to help uh, populate the library, it's a collective resource for everybody to share. So that is linked from the tree fodder page on civilpasturebook.com. And if folks have questions about navigating that, feel free to, to reach out. But for now, I'm going to stop sharing and change the hosting to Eliza and you can get your stuff up and then I'm going to steal it back and we'll get going. All right, let's see. Oh my God, I'm terrified you guys can see my whole desktop. Uh, let's see what you know, one thing that's interesting is I can't see what I'm sharing necessarily. Oh, no? um, Let's see. Remote control. Can you see? What can you see? I see your old desktop with some. Oh no. Okay. And such. Okay, so maybe it's just a fluid desktop deal then. You can also stop and reshare just the window that you want to share. Either All right. Way. Can you see the Google Slides now? Yes. Okay. All right. We're good. Um, cool. It's not, I mean, you know, as we talked, it's not a, it's not a formal presentation. It's just a bunch of pictures. <laughs> so okay. yeah, I'm ready when you're ready. So how do I stop shit? No, you're just going to steal it back from me now. I have reclaimed the host so you can still share. Okay, perfect. A little Zoom glitch, but we should be good. You can do your thing. And if you need to swap anything, we can just, it's an easy toss back. So it's just, I'll hold the ball okay. for now. Great. All right. Started. You there? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Do you, okay. So should I just get going and um, announce myself and go from there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That'd be great. Uh, yeah. So hello, everybody. My name is Eliza Greenman, and I'm owner of Hog Tree, and uh, I'm I'm in Northern Virginia, and I'm a mulberry freak. Um, I got into mulberries. A few years ago, I guess in 2017, um, I was just sort of fed up with the culture surrounding 
Well, just the feed based, like grain based culture surrounding livestock. And um, as an, I'm an orchardist by training, I'm also a forester by training. And so, well, by education, I'm a forester. And so I, um, I just wanted to really head into a direction that used trees more so to feed livestock. And that's basically how hog tree came about, which my goal is to reduce feed consumption uh, with the use of, with, with sort of the, the planned use of orchard trees, nut trees, fruit trees, um, and also fodder trees. And really when I was putting all of this together, um, mulberries just stood out as total rock stars. And little did I know um, at the time, but uh, they are the oldest agroforestry crop in the world. Um, they've, been, they've been manipulated by humans for over 7,000 years um, in order to feed silkworms so they've been they've been feeding livestock for a, a very long time in a planned way and a lot of the mulberries we see today are a relic or or maybe not a relic but a product of just you know 7000 years of tankering and so i'm happy to be here today to talk about uh, mulberries and and how i think they're just probably one of the if not the I think they're the most amazing tree crop there is personally. And that's coming from a lot from me because I'm um, an heirloom apple freak as well. And I, I, I mean, I'm just a tree crop supporter in, in many ways and I go down rabbit holes all the time. Um, but I think mulberries really have um, an interesting place in this world um, and especially in agroforestry. And um, so, Part of what I'm going to talk to you, to you about today is just, you know, the basics behind mulberries. Um, just give you a general overview of, of what you should know to get you up to speed. But then I'm hoping, uh, Steve and I will have a conversation about a bunch of different things, but really I'm hoping to just to hammer through to you all that these things are really incredible and everybody should start trying to figure out how to grow them because they are the most underrepresented tree crop in the United States in terms of like the fact that we, they have a major history here. Um, and also that some of those, some of the, some of them are the most, the oldest trees on the landscape today. Like a lot of trees that were brought here by silkworms or sorry, they were brought here for silk culture are here today still and yet they get totally, totally just ignored uh, despite the fact that they were planted and they're in these old, old plantation homes or old, and you know, old anywhere basically in Virginia. So yeah, um, I guess I'll give you my pitch real quick. And that is, um, I'll, I'll bring you up to speed on mulberries and the history is that when, red mulberries are native to the United States. And so their native range is um, the East Coast and through like probably into New York and then West. Some of the native range they say heads into Ontario and through the Midwest, a tip of Iowa and down um, probably into Mississippi, Louisiana, um, maybe a tiny bit of Texas. And, and over, so their range is quite large. Um, but today, and since I'm on the East Coast and Steve's on the East Coast, um, I'll, I'll be giving a bit more of an East Coast centric talk, but today's mulberries that we find in the wild are largely no longer purely Morris rubra or red mulberry. And that's because so many mulberries have been brought to the United States over the last, oh, 400 years that rapid hybridization has occurred almost everywhere, um, at least almost everywhere east of the Mississippi. And so something I really want to hammer home is if any time you're, you're going to see if you look for mulberry trees to purchase, that they're going to tell you they're Morris rubra. And more than likely, if this nursery is east of the Mississippi, 
you're going to have a hybrid. And the reason for that is it starts with King James, you know, when we first sent colonists over to the United States or over to the, what is now the United States? Um, they brought over, they sent a whole bunch of Asian mulberries, so Morris Alba, and those were planted because they saw the colonies as a, as a potential place to make silk and get rich. And so every colonist that owned land had to plant uh, Morris Alba. And this was in the range of the, of the native Morris rubra, but Morris Alba produces way more pollen. And it's like, it's just more aggressive in terms of reproductive strategy. And so soon, soon thereafter, we start to see a lot of hybrids happening um, in the, like around where I'm from, around Jamestown area, Southeastern Virginia. Um, and it sort of just started to move out from there. And then again, so that whole thing died down, like the whole mulberries for silk, that died down in the early 1700s. And then it was reinvigorated again in the early 1800s where millions upon millions upon millions of white uh, mulberry were sent from China um, to all over the United States, uh, Pennsylvania, you, and a lot of times in the Southeast. So, so New York, Pennsylvania, um, but definitely Virginia, North Carolina, um, South Carolina, all those places were being sent just millions upon millions of mulberries because there was major prospecting once again to raise our own silk in the United States. And so that's when it really sealed the deal of hybridizing mulberries. And so that's something I really just once again, uh, if you see somebody advertising Morris rubra, don't believe them um, unless they have the genetic, a genetic background to put it up. And there's a large amount of people who um, want us, they want to grow Morris rubra because they don't view it as invasive, yet they view Morris alba as invasive. Um, and so that whole argument is, I think nowadays you'll see people labeling things as Morris rubra just for um, people's perception when really it's just not. Um, so yeah, and out of Morris, so out of all this like in, intermingling in the United States, what came out of this was we ended up with a phenomenon of the everbearing mulberry. So that's when Morris rubra and Morris alba cross. You and there's a slight chance that the resulting like progeny of that cross is going to produce mulberries on new on brand new buds for a certain amount of time. And so where I'm from, a lot of, I have a mulberry, it's called the Hicks, that'll produce for 90 straight days um, in, in my climate. And if you go in you like towards Louisiana, they reportedly will produce from late April until early August. And so that's just, it's just like this, I don't even know if it's a mutation or not, but it's the ability to throw fruit on brand new buds that, so the more, the more vigor you have growing, the more buds that will produce fruit. And uh, so we have mulberries in the United States that are, that are really cool because they are producing a lot of fruit. So if it's fruit that you're after, um, which could be for human consumption or animal use um, or animal fodder, uh, that's one thing that we've got going for us that's pretty exciting, and especially in the land of fruit exploring and trying to find uh, what's going on, you know, trying to find something new and something valuable. But also, uh, we have a ton of Asian silkworm, um, silk mulberry genetics in this country that were selected for higher protein values, um, higher minerality, higher digestibility, and that's been naturalized in our landscape for the most part. And so we're really at this junction of, if we could just open our eyes up a little bit more uh, and accept mulberry rather than having it be the redheaded stepchild, um, I think that we could, it could really prove to be beneficial for like our ev evolution of uh, silvopasture for 
you know, just drought, drought resistance or drought proofing our protein sources and our late season, you know, late summer fodders and things like that. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be here just to help try and spread some of this mulberry gospel, because I really do think it's, I think it's a big deal. Um, and, and I think we should all, we should all pursue it. And with that said, I really need to hammer home also that there's so little research on mulberry. Um, I think Missouri just put out a paper, which is great. That's highlighting, I think, I think they're calling it rubra. It might be rubra by the way, but uh, when I asked the author if there is any genetic testing done, I don't think so. Um, but anyway, there's just like, we've not sorted through it. No institutions have sorted through it really on what's what. Um, and uh, yeah, there's just, it's just a mountain of info. Um, so, so there's that. And today, um, I apologize. I have, I, I just have a few pictures that I lined up because of um, wanting to have a conversation with Steve about mulberries. Um, but I'm, so I don't have like a planned presentation for you all. I sort of canned that, uh, but I am, and I can't see any sort of chat. Let's see here. Okay. Okay, so yeah, I can see the chat now anyway, but I'm wanting to, yeah, Steve, I mean, do you wanna have a conversation about mulberries? I really do. Okay, <laughs> let's do it. I wanna, um, yeah, I wanna encourage other folks to, to join that conversation um, via, via chat or, or just miking, you know, un unmuting yourself and, and chiming in. So. I'll just kind of uh, share a bit about like what I'm thinking about with our farm and we can start there and then just keep going and Sounds yeah, good. times you want to pull up something or share something that's great. Um, so I think it's really interesting hearing this history and thinking about it and realizing that um, it has this huge potential and sort of like sitting underneath our noses. And I'm curious first actually if there's other factors of why it's been leveled to obscurity when um, other than sort of like the potential like invasive narrative that that's showing up, like why else are folks not familiar with and, and super excited and like leveraging mulberry in, in North America? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And honestly, like, I'm not so sure that one of the, one of my speculations is that in the United States, the rise of the silk mulberry industry or which which failed miserably by the way two times um but the rise of that industry was right it coincided at a perfect time of um of slavery in the united states and and from my explorations like traveling i, I see mulberries everywhere like you know i have this problem where i just see them everywhere but um in going from place to place to place to place, I'm starting to see like anywhere I stop that's some sort of Civil War monument, that our old Civil War plantation house or something like that. There's always, at least in the South, there's always some old, old mulberries there, like definitely turn of the century into 1800s old mulberries. And the best I can, if I were just to piece together a story, I would say the reason why those trees are still there is because of probably, you know, 180 years of care from enslaved people, as they were probably the ones to cultivate these trees for um, leaf production in order to feed the silkworms. And it seems to me like perhaps that's why, in a way, it's mulberries have faded, at least faded from the landscape and from the history uh, here in, well, at least in, in the South and in the Mid-Atlantic, it's potentially because that story really isn't being told. You know, the, the cultivation story of enslaved people and, and hopefully that will change, 
but also in doing a lot of historical, I've, I've really tried to hunt this hunt a narrative down for why this is. And um, there's, it's just like no, there's sure bushels of, of product relating to mulberries that's written about, but never who was raising it and such like that. And since the, since the, the industries just totally collapsed, I think there was no, nobody was writing it down. Nobody was telling the story. And so that's all I can come up with really, if I were to just quick, if I were to guess as to why they run completely under the radar today. Liza, this is Shauna. Um, hey, Shauna. Collapse about, hi. Was it a labor issue when the slavery went out or did it collapse for some other reason? It, it did collapse because of a labor issue, um, but also because we had no idea, really, we had no idea how to do this. Um, so like they, it's a real science in Asia, raising mulberries for silk production. And, um, and I think that we just loosey goosey'd it because you'll see a lot of people talk about feeding Osage orange to mulberry, to uh, silkworms and feeding paper mulberry to silkworms and feeding like poplar, you know? And it just shows you that we weren't breeding or selecting for amazing cultivars that, you know, fit our landscape and fit and fit the diets of silkworms. But instead we were just trying to make a bunch of money um, without really knowing what was going on. And so I think that's probably, probably adds into it is, you know, just, oh, hey guys, you, you know, this is kind of how you do it. Uh, you figure it out and we'll make a bunch of money is I think, I think along those lines as well of what happened. Doesn't sound similar to anything else we've ever tried to do in this, uh, in this culture of ours, it's complicated. Uh, <laughs> interesting. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> so, so building on that, I guess the question is, um, what are, are there characteristics of the white versus the red that are like different or important? And like, is it desirable to seek out more red or true red or does it not matter or doesn't, it's, it's not, it's a moot point this, it, it, at this junction because of the hybridization. So I'm just curious to like tease out some of the, yeah, differences yeah. in those two and, and how we think about approaching that if we are aware of this, uh, yeah, where things are at. <clears throat> yeah. So. Um, there is a difference between red and white, and part of that is, I'm going to see if I can pull up the picture really quick. Oh no, I need it in my computer. Okay, here we go. Let me show this picture. Make this light way larger. Well, I'm not sure if you guys can, here we go. It looks a bit like a mummy, but all right. So one of the major differences between red mulberry and white mulberry, so uh, Morris rubra and Morris alba is the idioblast. And so idioblasts are like calcium crystals, basically. They can be any sort of crystal, but in the case of mulberry, they're calcium crystals. I think it's calcium, hydroxide, I think, off the top of my head. But they are in the leaves. And one of the big differences is with Morris rubra, which often, that's our native mulberry, which often has a rougher leaf uh, to the touch. It's, and it almost feels like, like a hair or like it's tomentose. That's not hair. That's actually you feel it, feeling the tip of the idioblast that's raised much higher out of the leaf. And so that's one of the major differences you'll see, whereas Morris alba has a much more sunken, often even smaller idioblast uh, that you can't, that, that leads to the leaf feeling glossy um, and just really glabrous. And so that's one of the big issue, big things if we're talking about fodder is um, it's thought, and this is, once again, this is off the top of my head, um, but it's thought that a more glabrous leaf that sh that's not, that doesn't have um, as large or as 
uh, stick out <laughs> as as the idioblasts that stick out like a Morris rubra are um, easier to eat. Basically, they're less they're less of a of a mouth hazard. They you know they're just generally more pleasing. Um, it seems like. And I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say it seems like a lot of the fodders that are more so acceptable, the leaf fodders tend to have more glabrous leaves. Um, but that's one thing it, to think about is uh, is that the second thing is that Morris rubra isn't generally as hardy as Morris alba. Morris alba is really um, taken over the whole world <laughs> for the most part, and um, and so. Alba genetics are in Russia, so like you'll see those as in the United States, they're they're advertised as Morris Alba Tartarica. So that's those are Russian super hardy Alba genetics uh, that have no no rubra um, in them whatsoever. And the rubras tend to be um, they tend to be taller trees more forest like trees they like well drained coves you know they they're not they're more site specific and also they have a need to be uh they they need a they need more moisture basically whereas alba um has time and time again it establishes in drought conditions it is i mean it's just really bulletproof um, a lot of the time. So it's more hardy, it's more drought resistant, whereas um, Morris rubra in its true form, not a hybrid, is also um, more hard, well, is less hardy and and more site specific um, in, in its needs. It just isn't able to stress out as much as Morris alba. And these hybrids are show even though you know one there's no work being done on this in the United States to talk about it but you know they're everywhere and so that's just showing me and and they and they run the gamut and and uh, if you look at there's a good paper out um, that I could probably find if there's need of all these arboretums that have taken you know that have pressed leaves and have them in their in their database as Morris rubra, but when they ran into the genetics, they were all hybrids. And so it just runs the gamut of finding, finding palatability, finding protein content, finding them growing like on south facing slopes with low organic matter, you know, like I think there's a once again, I think there's a lot of opportunity in finding these in working with these hybrids to find um, you kind of get the best of both worlds in, in it. So you might get more vigor. You might get I don't know. There's a lot there's a lot unknown about this. What would you say then in, in terms of folks spending time sort of looking for specimens in their local landscape and working to propagate those and versus sourcing like plant material, even named cultivars. Like, what's the balance to strike there in terms of bringing more yeah. into, into a site and trying to start playing with it? Right. I would absolutely search at least regionally for you know something that's within your climactic constraints um, for and, and things to look for. You know, if you're looking for fruit, which the fruit is great too as a fodder. Um, if you're looking for fruit, like something to look for is either a concentrated heavy drop. Um, here, let me share this screen real quick. I'll show you. Um, oh, I might not have it. I might not have it labeled on my computer. Um, so like you're looking for just a tree that's got so much fruit on it at a certain amount of time, and they're all sort of sort of coloring up at once that's a rare trait and so that's more determinant that shows that the fruit is just gonna drop like a ton of the tree's gonna drop a ton of fruit right then and there um and so within say like maybe a one to two week window that's pretty rare with with mulberries because they do tend to spread out a little bit more um in time but the other thing would be to look in your landscape in July, like mid July, if you're so if I'm zone seven, 
And if I'm looking in my landscape in mid July and I see trees that are still loaded with mulberries, I almost always file that away as this is an everbearing that I need to check into again um, and look for. Uh, and, and just make sure and like check into it next, you know, in, in August and see if it still has mulberries. Um, I look for fruit size because that does matter with, you know, if you want to ever harvest for markets um, in a clamshell or something, you can totally, people would actually prefer mulberries to blackberries if you can get a good flavor um, because they don't have seeds in them that most of them don't have seeds. Um, so yeah, that's, that I would absolutely look in your in your local area or in your region um, to find because you're gonna find them like they're there they're everywhere as far as I'm concerned. And then are there there's a number of questions and some folks are providing some good resources for for sourcing up material and what you would want to consider there and what what sort of. Um, Places you'd potentially recommend would be helpful, I think, for folks. Sure. Um, I'm looking through right now some of the places. I'm under I'm unaware of a lot of these nurseries that are being mentioned, mostly because I am, yeah, Kukuso is a great Kukuso, by the way, is probably the only known determinant variety out there. Um, and with that said. I'm a big fan of growing out seedlings or, or, you know, digging up little little seedlings all over the place, planting them, and then grafting them later to cult, known cultivars. Um, I do that a lot. I think that's, and I have different motives for doing that, but um, it just is, you know, you're ensuring that you're getting a, a known set of genetics rather than um, taking, risking it to chance with a seedling from your area. Um, unless you have an incredible seedling and then people probably are gonna want scion of that um, to do the same because they, they graft pretty easily. Um, but anyway, of, of the nurseries that, so I, I have to buy mulberries by like the thousands just because of my, the work I'm in. Um, JPLN nursery, or is it JLPN? It's one of those is is a good one. Um, I would really avoid Cold Stream in Michigan if I were you. Uh, their quality is just not okay given the amount you pay. Um, and those are those are Morris Alba Tartarica, and they also advertise, I believe, Morris Rubra, which probably most definitely isn't Morris Rubra. Um, something to think about with Tartarica is that it wakes up a lot sooner in the landscape and goes to sleep. It's, it's just this growing season is, is shorter, um, which can cause uh, late frost damage to any of your grafted varieties onto it. If you are in an area prone to late frost or um, prone to frost in general, uh, like a cold seep or something. Um, some, if you're, if you're wanting to get just cheap seedlings and you're okay. I mean, most of the seedlings are fine. Like most of those hybrids are fine. Anything advertises rubra, as long as you just get some good size on it, like maybe maybe um, a quarter inch in, ca in caliper is what I would recommend for starting out with trees, um, unless you're digging your own. And those can easily be found in state nurseries for, for like, Missouri's nursery uh, is quite good and cheap, you know, order a hundred or more. And I think they're 30 cents a piece. Um, but also like throughout the Southeast, there's tons of nurseries that um, you can call, there's basically aggregators that can hook you up and aggregate everything from different states and then just send it to you. So those, those are helpful as well. But unfortunately we lost, um, a nursery out in, on the West Coast, Lawyer Nursery, they went out of business and they had the best stock running for a great price. Um, so I've, I've been just trying to find the next best. And I think the JLPN nursery so far is, is the best I've found in turn, but you have to order like, I think $500 or more, um, but that's for bulk. 
Yeah, glpnliners.com, that's right. Okay. Let's see. So there's lots of lots of directions we could go. I guess um, one more thing I wanna just preface is like a foundational thing and then we could see what where other folks wanna ask a question. Maybe I'll defer to folks who wanna unmute and, and say hello. Um, but just to talk a little bit about the um, sort of ecology, like where it fits in the ecological landscape. And then also if you're thinking about locations on, on a landscape to plant, what are some of the best bets for that? Okay, so ecology, like ecologically speaking, um, there are some papers not in the United States, but I think in India. Uh, and I think there's another one in Australia talking about how they've determined some mulberries to be um, to harbor nitrogen fixing bacteria. So that's something to think about in terms of um, basically nutrient cycling. And if you're ever thinking about um, just what, because there's a, there's a big tendency of thinking that these trees are stealing all this they're stealing nutrients from like the crops that you're trying to grow in between them. And that's, that's not totally um, on point uh, from a, at least from an agricultural perspective. Um, ecologically though, like, I mean, I don't know, I could go a million different directions with that term. What are you looking for in like in specifics for me to say about the ecology of um, berries? Someone was asking about like bird and insect relationships as one oh. piece, and then, oh, yeah. and then I, I think just thinking about their niche, like are there are there particular places that they thrive versus versus suffer is what I think about a lot in terms of weather place. So the okay. intersecting like the microclimate that they're best suited for and maybe worse suited for that kind of okay yeah. yeah 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 ecologically speaking like as a if you're gonna if let's just talk about wildlife they're incredible because every everything eats mulberries. So this year I had a massive disaster where um, a whole turkey family can, got into my nursery and ate every single mulberry I had and ate everything, left everything else alone. They just defoliated the whole thing twice um, and uh, causing me total crop failure basically. But deer, I mean, you name it, cows, deer, pigs, anything eats mulberry leaves because they're the best of the best uh, as far like out there as far as I'm concerned and also like if you've ever watched a, a mulberry tree in fruit um, in the summertime it's it's just the most happening spot for birds they're just flying in flying out um, it's just so much energy and activity going on um, at least for the frugivorous birds that uh, I mean, you can't, it seems to me you can't go wrong. They love, they love them. And, and that's, that's a hybrid, you know, that's not just, they don't just love Morris rubra. Like they're eating crazy amounts of hybrid fruit as exhibited by the amount of cra the crazy amounts of seedlings along fence lines and power lines and things like that, where they like to, like to sit. Um, in terms of what, where they, what they don't like, they don't like low acidity. Um, I do have a slide for that. Let's see here. Okay, so they don't like low acidity. Um, and this, this chart is just showing, uh, this is just tree vigor, basically. Or is this leaf quality? Hold on, I might've gotten them mixed up. Yeah. Uh, you mean low pH? Low pH, they don't like correct. Yeah, right. They don't like high acidity. My bad. Um, and so as you move towards seven on this chart, you're seeing that proteins are up. Um, you have more leaf leaf area, uh, which is this one. Wait, is this the same one? Yep, I put the same chart twice. Anyway, you end up with a higher amount of leaves. It, they just have higher yields and they have higher proteins and higher calcium and the tree just takes, it just has a bit much better natural uptake as the, as the, you know, pH heads towards seven. Um, they also don't like wet feet, like permanent wet feet. So 
really you need to have well-drained soil. And after that, I have not run into, if, if I can handle, you know, the, the high, the pH heading towards seven meets like a well-drained soil, I, can't, I haven't gone wrong. And that's, even if the soil is heavier, it likes a lighter soil. So, I mean, most things do, but um, I've seen inc incredible vigor out of a heavier soil, just as long as it doesn't bog down in this in, and become super water saturated. So they grow, that's all to say, they grow mostly everywhere. Um, as long as you can, keep them out of the water and, and they will grow, you know, with a lower pH, but they, or a, sorry, a higher, whatever, they'll grow, you know, 4.6, they'll grow and they'll thrive, but they're just not gonna grow as well. Oops, sorry, I was muted. Um, there are some questions and maybe you wanna share a little more about the leaf, leaf aspect of, of fodder for mulberry, maybe just give a little, little spiel, and then we can dive into some of these questions if they're not answered. But folks are definitely interested in that specific application, given our topic today. <laughs> sure. So with leaf fodder and mulberries, I'll I'll just show some photos as I'm talking about this. Um, time and time again, I mean, all over the world, they've been testing this. It's becoming more and more of a of a topic. Is how much they or they're heading, they're sort of the heading towards the center of being a golden child in terms of, in terms of being a leaf fodder. So um, what does that mean? It means you can feed mulberry, depending on where you live in the United States, um, you can feed mulberry leaves at least once per year. Uh, for me in zone seven, I can get away with a solid two feeding, two cuttings of mulberries a year and potentially a third. Uh, in the potentially a third. It just depends what my what my water situation is like that year. But I'm going to show you just and, and the way to do that by cutting. There's a couple different ways. Um, one is a high. One is pollarding. One is coppicing. And I'll show you. I'll just run through some quick photos. These are just some old photos. Like this was in uh, I think this was in France um, of just the high pollard um, and that, you know, that's used for livestock fodder. That's not, that's, there's not, I mean, sure you can like bit, make barrels and things out of mulberries, but, but this is, this is all basically how to feed livestock. Here's a lower pollard that is today, very common today in Turkey. There's an even lower pollard from, from that. Um, and then just showing you like, this is, this is very likely the first flush over here on the right from, so you cut this back in the winter time to your, to your pollarded fist. And then this is probably the first flush. Um, and I usually cut around, for me, I feel like I feel pretty comfortable cutting around the first of July. And then I can cut again in mid August and still have enough reserves to get that first flush back again. Um, it's, it's all about pruning with this. And so those of you who know about, know about tree pruning um, or the tree physiology when it comes to pruning uh, will probably be better off in understanding this, but it's not total rocket science in that the more energy you can make and store in the roots over, over the winter time, the more you're gonna have, you're, it's gonna rock it out. Okay, so in terms of other leaf fodder, like I can't tell you anything. The, the most important thing to know is that you need to give these trees rest. Um, so yeah, you can, I just saw a question, can you let cows direct browse on mulberry? Absolutely, um, you can. And like I was just talking to, my vet the other day who we have cows here and uh, he came over and he has a like a PhD in animal nutrition or in cow nutrition or something like that and he was like oh yeah mulberries are great like totally great nobody should be afraid of mulberries when it comes to cattle 
Um, but you need to let them rest. And so if you just let the cows eat every new leaf coming out of your mulberry pollards, um, the tree's going to die or the tree's going to suffer. And so that's where rotational grazing comes in, that you really need to plan when you're going to let these these cows or these pigs or your goats or whatever eat the mulberry leaves. Um, and either you cut and carry or you yeah, rotationally graze so that they're not on those mulberries more than once or twice a year. And, um, and you go from, from that. Uh, or cut and, care, cut and don't carry if it's tall enough that they can't reach the sprouts. Right, correct, correct. Um, how does the tree need to be, how old does the tree need to be before first pollard? So for me, I start pollarding in year two that might not be the case for people in colder in colder climates. Um, I have incredible vigor on my here with the rain and the heat and my soils. Um, so yeah, I start in year two. I always basically I start pollarding once the tree is out of deer browse height because I have an incredible amount of deer here. Um, and so once I can get the first cut above deer browse, that's what I concentrate on. And it's incredible to watch how it, it extrapolates from there. Um, and just, you know, the first pollard, second year, you have like four new shoots. After the second year, you've got 20. So, I mean, it's really incredible how, how much, how much they're, they're throwing in terms of protein, just in terms of yields. And then there is a question related about the, is there like high yielding cultivars that have superior leaf yield or quality that would justify bringing those in or? Oh yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, and those are gonna be the Japanese, out of the Japanese breeding programs. Um, so Japan has a similar climate to, to at least like you. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I, I guess it has also similar climate to me depending on where you are. But yeah, more of a humid, temperate, cold, temperate climate in some ways. And they have had mulberry breeding programs going on for a very long time, but they also, you know, a lot of the stuff is still pretty new. And that's actually where Kukosu comes from. And there's, there's a female, there's a couple Kukosus um, and they're all silk rearing, but one of them produces fruit and the other one's a male. And I think the other one's a male too. There's like 20, 21 and something else. So those are, but yeah, so those are showing large leaves. Um, so that's one thing that's been selected for silkworms is just like a lot of that's because it's manual, it's hand labor. So the larger the leaves and if, you know, the larger the leaf in a harvest of one hand swipe, you know, means higher yields. Um, so yeah, larger leaves is one and then high protein content, great digestibility. Um, they're just working their way towards being more nutrient packed, really. And um, something I would recommend is like in, in my county, I've uh, finagled a lot of free leaf analyses through my extension uh, for mulberry and actually for anything, but they, they, I've got, I've been things that look important to me, like larger, leaved seedlings or stuff that I just notice is always picked off first, I've been getting nutrient analyses done. And sure enough, it seems, there seems to be a correlation between just like power packed minerals meets, meets uh, proteins. So yeah. So Eliza, um, do your pigs manure them? Are you having the animals go where the mulberries are? I'm cutting for the most part, I'm cutting in play for the pigs. And so, um, and that's why I've got the way my paddocks are arranged is they come through twice in a year. And so I'm cutting in July and then I'm cutting again in mid August, uh, mid to late August. And the pigs are right there. And they're right there. Yeah. And they, it's like a, the Pav, of Pavlov's dog reaction. Like the moment I, I got these like battery powered pruners because of carpal tunnel, because <laughs> of pruning. And, uh, and the moment they hear that, they just come running. 
their is size. Is there any, any difference in a dormant pruning versus a pruning during the season? No, not really. I mean, you can always, you can, in dormant pruning, I do make sure to get back to that pollard head um, just because the, the most wood I can take off in the wintertime means that I'll have more new shoot growth <laughs> come, come once the trees have, you know, reactivated with sap. And so uh, I do try to make a more of a flush cut. There is some thought on leaving some leaving stubs, um, small stubs, just because of a difference in bud, difference in buds, which is getting into the weeds a little bit for this talk. Um, but with, I just cut all my fresh stuff back to the nub and um, it seems to do fine. Do you feed the uh, winter pigs to the hogs also? The winter cuttings? We even have hogs in the winter. <laughs> no, I don't have them in the winter. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> in the, yeah, goats would love them. Uh, but in the future, I'm hoping to figure out like an easy way to just chip them and put them and have them just shoot them right underneath the trees. Uh, but that's a little bit too much labor and for me, and I've got some ideas of how to move forward that, but also uh, they're not ready to be discussed necessarily. <laughs> and then siled and then the pigs next year could eat it. Oh, I've yeah. never thought about ensiling hardwood like dormant cuttings, but certainly there's some minerals there to, to try and make palatable. There's, there's probably some calories too. Mm -hmm. They have a cecum, right? So they can digest some cellulose. Right, right. A couple questions. Would there be ways to manage uh, mulberry for both a fruit drop and a leaf fodder harvest? Within oh, the totally. Season, or what yeah. does that look like? Um, you just got to manage what your, so you got to manage what your canopy and what your understory looks like. So like, if you want fruit drop, you're looking at most most mulberries, unless, so let's get it. All right, so remember when I said that ever bearing mulberries will fruit on like the most brand new buds? Um, a lot of times that's, you need a certain age. It needs to reach a certain maturity before you, those new shoots are doing that for you. Um, and so, Either you figure out your, like either you have a bunch of small trees that you're cutting back, you know, maybe every three years or something, or every two to three years that are, are ever bearing. And so letting those rain down fruits, or, you know, you set up like old timey, I mean, old time orchards in the South, like before, before livestock headed indoors, um, they had mulberry orchards where the pig ever bearing mostly hicks and stubs where the pigs would be out and the chickens would be outside all summer eating the mulberries. And then the idea of leaf fodder was when those, when those leaves dropped and every, I mean, the pigs would just gobble up the leaves and yeah, they have a lower protein content and they have a somewhat lower nutritional content but they're still better than grass, a lot of the grass growing underneath there. And so that's an idea too. Um, something also that I've been working on is the idea of a frost drop. Um, so here in Virginia, like we got a frost, we get frost around like late in late November and the leaves are still like succulent green. And so once that frost happens, those like new succulent green well those gorgeous leaves just fall off and all the cows everybody is just vacuuming them up as quickly as possible um and so there's a lot of different strategies to think about but mulberries are pr are pretty i mean i would say if you're going for leaf fodder and you aren't in siling which is making silage out of the leaves um to hold off and feed whenever you want then you got to think about the leaves. You can get maybe two, one to two, maybe three, definitely three if you're like in the deep south, maybe even four, harvest of, of leaves off your trees. 
And then you just plan for your seasons for when the mulberries are gonna drop. And you can have those two together, no problem. I wanna just open the floor if there's like more questions about management of established mulberry um, in different systems that think people might be thinking about. Um, there there was a question to... someone asked about um, black goo upon pruning and I've seen that on my white mulberry also. I'm just, do you have any experience? I've, I've heard other people say that mulberries are bleeders. Have you seen mm -hmm. that, have that experience, Eliza? Yeah, mulberries bleed for sure. I mean, if you, they'll, they bleed, especially so like for instance in grafting i do a lot of bench grafting of mulberries and the later in the season you get the more and more they they start bleeding but i haven't read any papers on this but it seems to have a i'm, I'm sure that sap that's coming through i mean i'm not sure but i'm going to say it. my guess is that sap that's coming through um is anti or pro microbial it has polyphenols in it you know it's got healing qualities rather than rather than not and so um they are so vigorous and they're so they have so much life and that's because we've been breeding them for seven thousand years to be cut repeatedly over and over again um is that i haven't seen that that loss of of sap be um, a problem now that's that's with responsible cuts so i don't cut below really i don't cut below two inches if i can uh, two inches in diameter um so i always try to maintain any new cut i make is two inches or less um sometimes if i'm going to top work a tree or something that you know i don't really care if it lives or dies because it's on a fence line or something you know, I might be cutting something a little bit larger than that, like four inches or five inches in diameter. And yeah, I mean, those are those bleed and that's that really sets the tree back. But it seems to me like if you can stay within two inches or less, your sap flow, which tur which turns black and gummy. But, you know, that's just what happens when you have nutrients and sugar that are flowing out of the tree. Um, it seems like it's much it's a more calculated risk on their part and it's you're going to do fine and the tree will do fine hey liza i pushed yeah. i muted myself when i asked some or when i commented a minute ago so i just wanted to backtrack to the fruit if you, issue i thought i remembered at cloak trones that they talked about leaving like a branch or two for fruit while you pollarded the rest that people used to do that yeah totally they do you're absolutely right like and that's just to show you could do anything with these things. You can leave half the tree in fruit and you can pollard the other half of the tree. Um, I think I think we saw that with um, cultural promiscua or using yeah. pollarded mulberry yeah. to grow grapevines okay. in Italy um, so that they could have also an early fruit crop coming off of some of them. And, and but uh, yeah, you can you should you can sort of have it all with these things if, if you'd like. And yeah, apologies for overseeing that. That's totally true. <laughs> Other questions from folks on management of establishment? Then I have a pile of questions about sort of propagation and early, early life care. Okay. Anyone else want to chime in or throw something in the chat about management system? Uh Someone did ask about invasiveness. Uh, you know, have you seen a lot of dispersal of, of seed, seed dispersal and stuff coming up in the woods from your plantings, or no? Uh, not in the woods. No, they don't. They don't handle um, low shade, uh, high shade right. well whatsoever. Right. Um, I see plenty coming up along my fence lines and in the pastures, um, which is, is great <laughs> because everything eats them. Um, but I think that. From an invasive perspective, like, you know, honestly, one of the best things you can do is cut down all the males. <laughs> but that's that's my general that's my general in, uh, inclination for most of botany these days. But um, because the males are the ones that are shooting pollen, and the pollen travels from, from mulberries at half the speed of sound, so I mean, it means business. 
Um, so that's one thing is if we, as a society, transition completely to fem only female mulberries, they'll never be pollinated and produce seed. And uh, we won't have any allergens as well, but um, that's, that's an ideal scenario. But no, I mean, in terms, of, in terms of invasiveness, like the only thing that's really causing invasiveness is perhaps the birds that are thriving on the mulberries. And um, they're not like paper mulberry that are rhizomatous. You know, most, most mulberries just stay in place um, unless there's some sort of disruption that where a, a root comes to, to the top of the soil. So I think that, I don't know, to, to be, there's a lot more plants to be concerned about in my mind than mulberry. <laughs> they're just, they're just eaten heavily browsed instantly. Like they're, they seem to be kept in check. And if they're not kept in check, I think we need to question our wildlife health first and not blame the trees for it. Right. I'm gonna let's talk about early early life. So, see, starting from seed, softwood cuttings, hardwood cuttings. What's what's your experience with? There seems like there's there's not one tried and true, and there's a lot of different um, strategies out there. Um, mm -hmm. let's, yeah, love to just hear about that. Yeah, there's definitely not a tried and true. So, I have started growing more mulberries from seed. I'm not sure if it's worth my time to do that, um, because I'm not one to keep cultivated beds neat, really. But um, seed is easy to come by. Uh, if, you have any, if you have any mulberries that are producing fruit, uh, look no further than like a nearby stump or on the trunk of that tree, if the tree is laying down to a certain angle or something, um, because all the, the animals that might spread the seed outside of birds like raccoons and foxes and such, um, they tend to defecate on promontories and, and make it very obvious for you. So you can, you got a sec, I mean, raccoon poo is really gross. Um, and and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of terrible articles about all the things that it harbors. But, um, you know, if you want an easy way to collect mulberry seed, that's a good way to get like a thousand in one go is to just put a, put but some mulberry poo in a bag um, and spread it about in, in your bed. If it's not pollinated, so I, some of them make fruit without seed. Right, some of them make fruit without seed, but you can tell when you're looking at the poo, for sure. You can see the little seed. Um, and also you'll know the trees that are, are full of seed too. Um, cause, Cause you're right, there's some around me that are seedless and there's some that have tiny seeds. Um, so that's one way you can plant them if you're good with raising things from seed. Um, and it's, it's a, it's a crapshoot on how soon that'll fruit for you. Um, I've had some seedlings fruit in year three, some year four, some in year six, but usually six years is the absolute top for, for all that. Um, doing a lot of times the the narrative is, oh, you can just take a cutting off a mulberry and stick it in the ground and it'll grow a tree. That's absolutely not true, especially with the hybrids, um, the, the amount of hybrids we have in the United States. Uh, so there's, for instance, the Hicks Everbearing Mulberry, which is a famous old heirloom um, for just being just dumping fruit on the ground. That thing won't root from a from a dormant cutting no matter how hard you try really, but uh, it will root from summer cuttings. And so what I would say is if you're having a hard time with rooting mulberry cuttings that are dormant, um, don't just stop trying rooting do dormant cuttings from it and instead revisit that tree in the summer, get like a bucket of perlite or something or, or even just peat moss that's damp and stick them all in there in the shade and they'll very likely root for you. I've not really encountered any mulberries that won't root from summer cuttings. Um, so that's, that's the way to go 
if you're, but, but also it's in the middle of summer, everybody's busy, it's hot, you don't want to be doing that, but that seems to be a good way. Um, and also you can layer mulberries fairly easy. So if there's a branch that's near to the ground, you can go ahead and weigh that down um, in any way you see fit and mound wood chips over it basically and that and, and scarify it uh, or, or like, you know, slice it in one way or another just to, just to try and get some buds to activate where you injured it. And usually that area will root too and you can cut it right from there and have, have a new tree or several. I'm trying to think of what else. Um, one time I was sent mulberry leaves with a petiole from somebody expecting me to cut it, expecting me to root it. And um, I didn't try, I was pretty disgusted with that. So I'm not sure if that's even possible, but uh, it, it's also in the realm of what people think. Doug is suggesting some warm feet for uh, if, if cuttings are gonna take root in the dormant season. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, most, most thing, most things, most dormant cuttings need a bottom heat. Um, so if you're going to go for it, but like I said, do not try Hicks. <laughs> do not buy Hicks cyan from me and try to root it because it's just not going to work. Um, so yeah, warm bottom heat is always great when trying to root anything in the wintertime, especially in a cold bottom heat in a cold room. With, with good humidity. Okay, and then new, new seedlings in the first few years, there's some notes from folks about heavy watering while getting them established, um, fertilizing, Gavin's got some notes in there, pruning sucker growth, any other pieces of early care that you wanna touch on for folks? Let me look at. It's like pretty loaded, pretty close to the, the most recent. Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much, to me, that's tree 101 is if you're going to plant a tree, you're going to want to have it be base, you know, you're going to want to be, have the root collar be just slightly above your soil level. And then if you can mulch it, that'd be great. I mean, mulberries do, we have it depending on your climate, depending on your so soil. So that's heat, water, um, and basically how heavy or light your soils are is going to affect the vigor of, and also the, the genetics of the mulberry are all gonna affect vigor. And so if you have a very vigorous tree, you might find that you don't need to manage the grass underneath that tree. Um, or like, cause in Asia, when you look, when you look at some of these um, mulberry plots, you'll see that it's just a barren wasteland underneath there. Like they just, nothing grows. And that's in order to get as much yields as possible without any sort of, any sort of uh, just, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm, I was looking for one word to find, but the answer is competition. Okay, so yeah. Uh, so if you, want to eliminate competition it's just a matter of your goals if you're looking for like super high if you're looking for the highest yielding possible that's something but also like mulberries are um very receptive to nitrogen like they can handle a lot of nitrogen um i've been to some mulberry trees that have year-round high density um poultry operations right there and where there was no grass and nothing but bird poop and basically they they couldn't have been happier um and so if you in integrating in talking about it as livestock fodder and in integrating like the idea of manure chicken manures hot manures um they're going to respond very favorably whereas in a lot of the silk culture in asia that's not the case um because they're just like plantations so so that's one avenue as well. Um, and then if you can keep it as a single trunk, uh, I, I would encourage you to do that. And, and that's just in order to get it to a desired height that you need. For me, I need it to be above deer brows. And 
and I'll mulch like two inches or something. I mean, I have, I put tree guards on the trees, like little spiral wraps, and that keeps, I can put mulch right up against that. And I don't worry. And I don't have any, I don't have any problems with roots coming out in the trees or anything like that. Anything else from folks? We got a few more minutes. Um, lots of great info here. Thank you. I will sell. I sell Hicks every year um, in the winter. So probably in like February, I put on my website hogtree.com. I sell Scion off Hicks. Um, I'm sure there's people selling cuttings that I sold them years ago that took when they grafted. Um, but also just beware, you know, of sometimes people don't keep good notes. <laughs> and so I can at least guarantee it's Hicks. Um, Liza, so a few years ago, you were giving Hicks to folks to see what their range was. Do, do you have results on that? Yeah, the range seems to be, <laughs> it can handle like negative five. Um, and that's about it. So yeah. it, see, that seems to be it's, it's cold tolerance is like, yeah, at most negative five degrees. What, what state or where, what was the location that there is one still growing? North, oh, north? in Connecticut, I have some growing well. Um, but it was, it's more so like east, it's along, it's, in maritime climate almost um and then yeah i mean i there's hicks growing in in new york there's hicks growing i don't have anybody that's succeeded with hicks in maine yet um but i you know it could probably handle like i would say zone 6b 7a is probably it's it's best range it's it's well 6b 7a for sure it's safe but I would say 6B, maybe 6A, if the, it might die back to the ground, but if the root system was heavily mulched, um, it'd probably be, be fine. So I've always appreciated uh, in the things I've heard you speak on and not just with mulberry, but lots of other cool trees and fruits and things you're exploring. Um, just a like, real deep dive into the the history and kind of all the, the humans and non-humans that have helped carry a certain species along, right? And so, and you alluded to we're in this interesting time right now with mulberry. And I'm just curious, like what would you project into the future if if everything lined up really well, what would mulberry look like in the landscape and for farms and for fodder? Oh man, it would be, it would be a way more compromised climates, um, like out West, for example, where their protein, you know, fodder protein is basically like alfalfa or high, de high water demanding um, crops is this could, I think that mulberries need to be used as a, as basically like a pasture saver um, where you'll see, you know, in, in Australia, for example, they have mulberry trees and some other trees like Kurajung that are purely rescue trees for if they don't get any rain and they, and their animals have to eat. And so like staircases have been carved into some of these trees for some of these ranchers to go up and they just cut the whole tree. Like they cut every, every branch basically like two inches or, or smaller off that tree and, and drop all that fodder for the cattle to eat. And it's seen as a, so it's seen as like a savior, a savior fodder. Um, so that's one thing um, is like a savior crop, but also, I mean, especially with more and more research coming out about hosting nitrogen fixing bacteria and things like that, I think we'll see it. it it's really, I think it's really lining up for being an alley cropping species. Um, especially if it's for, you know, if you want to run some pigs in that, through that, um, or, or any sort of livestock uh, on that 
afterwards or before, during, or whatever. Um, I'd like to see more, more mulberry fruit orchards coming up because there's certainly means to keep them smaller. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I would, I mean, I don't know if it were, if it were for me, hold on, I have this video. Let me see if I can pull it up real quick. Oh, well, here we go. I don't know if you all can see this, but this is super blurry. My, my apologies of just like a mulberry tuttle. And this is what they're harvesting the fruit from. Um, but hold on one sec. Let me see if I can get this video real quick to show you like, this is a person using basically an Indian version of a BCS to, to have a low, this is a very low pollard, but um, mm, here we go. Okay, so this is just a big long video, 25 minute long video showing how um, they've, they're basically harvesting mulberry like they would corn. <laughs> um, they, you know, mechanically speaking. And the idea about this is this is a perennial and it's a high protein yielding, high mineral yielding perennial. And so um, there's, there's just, I would love to see, I mean, I don't, I'm kind of against the idea of monoculture, you know, but something like this, uh, the screen that could, it just seems a lot smarter to me, especially if you could get in, you could, you could mess with this a bit, like add some willows, add some, you know, add some other, for me, I would add hackberry in there, some other nutrient dense, um, special minerality plants that survive getting cut back quite a bit and produce like it just seems like a really amazing perennial salad bar that could then be that this could be ensiled once it's harvested mechanically or it could be uh, you could harvest it with a bcs or you could like let animals on it and then take them off um so like i don't know i just feel like it mulberries have really the such a promise to be in any space, <laughs> really, in any capacity, orchard to like silage, mechanically harvested silage. Awesome, and there's some folks asking for a link to that video. I don't know if you put something. Oh here. man, I'd have to dig. My <laughs> uh, business partner and I, um, we search on the on the China side of Google a lot of the time. <laughs> we live. <laughs> I, I partially live in Chinese Google. And so um, I could probably just make upload this and make it available. Nice, that'd be great. I'll share that out with folks after this, okay. and we'll follow up on that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I think we'll pause our mulberry. Oh, there's so much to think about and get excited about. Thanks for carrying us on that journey. Um, welcome. Thanks, guys. Yeah. And let's see, folks, we are going to take a little break and we'll be wrapping up the day here. Um, starting at 2.45, so just a quick break and we're going to chat with Ashley about more research and some other interesting things happening at the Center for Agroforestry and uh, ways we can, we can engage. So uh, see you in a little bit. 